Well, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. I, I think I've never been so happy to be a media scholar. Um, what we've just been talking about um, ha has a history, and I just want to talk about television. Um, you know, I've been rewriting this paper after everyone's presentation, <laughs> um, and I need to rewrite it now. That um, in the 1950s, uh, the sitcom was shot with cameras that did not penetrate the performance space. So I Love Lucy, for example. Um, the sitcom I'm going to show you, Curb Your Enthusiasm, is shot with one camera, so it does penetrate the performance space. Um, one of the phenomenological crises of the cinema um, is that it's able to produce both subjective and objective uh, moments at the same time, cutting back and forth in shot, reverse shot, for example. So one solution to this crisis that you're talking about um, might be to get into the performer space, which is not happening um, as you watch these recordings. So I'll talk a little bit about um, why it matters that the camera's in the performance space in, in Curb Your Enthusiasm. Uh, okay, the, the title of my paper is What's Wagner Doc? Which was brutally censored out of the program. <laughs> um, the title that's in the program is much more descriptive, um, but my paper doesn't work without this pun. Uh, and so I'll start with that. The influence of Richard Wagner on the cinema is most forcefully presented as a musical exchange. Musicologist and critical theorist Theodore Adorno states quite simply, the Wagnerian leitmotif leads directly to cinema music. Uh, this is, of course, quite true at many levels of film criticism, um, although uh, John Dethridge oddly delimited with allegedly, I don't know what that meant. Um, first, and most obviously, one cannot imagine Korngold's score for The Adventures of Robin Hood, 1938, or John Williams' score for Star Wars V, 1980, without Dering des Limelungen uh, haunting the theater. In an intertextual domain, one of the most readily accessible references in the new Hollywood cinema is the right of Valkyrie uh, in Coppola's Apocalypse Now, uh, talked about by Alex Ross last night, a substitution cipher in which US Army helicopters replace Teutonic women on horses, a scene so iconic that Sam Mendes's Jarhead, uh, 2005, uses it ironically in a sequence in which Marines are flown on a commercial airliner to the first Gulf War, more Disneyland than Westmoreland. And yet, thank you. Um, <laughs> That took me like an hour, right? <laughs> and yet, despite such a wide array of understanding of Wagnerian musical influence, it seems oddly the case that the theorization of the intertextual relationship between opera and cinema is woefully lacking. As an adaptation scholar, it disturbs me that the body of criticism in my field uh, is devoted to the novel, and it dwarfs by many orders of magnitude the study of many important cultural forms from video games to opera. After all, if we take one of Wagner's major theoretical contributions to 19th century criticism at face value, the concept of the Gesamtkunstwerk, then the cinema, both its music and its image, is the direct descendant of the Wagnerian corpus. This essay, therefore, intends to pursue this line of reasoning with a scope not heretofore attempted, at least in my wing of the world in media studies. <laughs> Whether that's true in your world, we can talk about. Writing from the point of view of film theory and criticism, I will construct an architecture of intertextuality pertaining to Wagner uh, and moving images. What theoretical issues arise if we approach film adaptation intertextually? First, the basic mechanisms of the cinema arise in a new light. Many Hollywood films feature the wedding march from the bridal chorus of Lohengrin. But does it matter that these films have chosen this piece of music as opposed to Mendelssohn's? Given Wagner's anti-Semitic disdain for Mendelssohn, do such choices matter in understanding the way the Hollywood wedding scene works? This, it seems to me, is one of the beautiful intertextual questions uh, that haunt me all around the day. Like, how do cinemas represent weddings, and why do they represent it that way? And why do these iconic pieces of music keep cropping up all the time? Right? As a second example, the Gesamtkunstwerk work implies a particular theory of narrative scope which lies in opposition to the cinema. Except in the case of Andy Warhol, right, sleep eight hours long, and more pointedly, Hans-Jürgen Cyberberg, the 90 to 180 minute runtime is a virtual cultural universal economic imperative in the cinema. The Wagnerian corpus tends toward the epic, of course, moving from the multiple hour experiences of Tannheiser to Parsifal toward the epic structure of the ring cycle. 
In its classical form, the cinema gravitates towards a shorter length, at times venturing into the Wagnerian epic. For example, Peter Jackson's almost completed nine-hour expansion of Tolkien's Hobbit, but nonetheless expressing in Aristotelian terms a basic sense of the importance of a middle of a plot merely to delay, in Peter Brooks's formulation, the progress from beginning to end. Often, Hollywood cinema relies on what I have elsewhere called the up conversion of the short story form to construct the two hour feature film. However, the Wagnerian corpus creates the opportunity for narrative down conversion, a bottling of the epic impulse into a much smaller package. Nowhere in the history of visual art is this process better expressed than in the seven minute Warner Brothers animated short, What's Opera Doc? A comic distillation of the Wagnerian into a vehicle for the iconic feud between Elmer Fudd and Bugs Bunny and the impetus for my paper's censored title. My essay will float among these examples, attempting to build a method for understanding not only Wagner in the cinema, but for much ekphrastic art. The intersection between Wagner and moving images should not be reduced to the weak concept of adaptation. For every Hans-Jürgen Cyberberg directly attempting uh, Wagnerianism in five-hour marathons, there are hundreds of cinematic Wagner engagements to be found in media history if we just bother to look for them. When Sam Raimi attempts to reinvent the Western as a comic form in The Quick and the Dead, um, really the only Western of any importance between Unforgiven and the post-9-11 uh, 2003 Westerns, um, why does Raimi choose a gunfighting contest, the musical stuff of the singing contests in Wagner? To what effect does Trevor Jones's score for Excalibur, John Borman, 1981, draw Wagner's Nordic mythology into the orbit of a Thorian legend? Compelling questions, these, but clearly the stuff of a much larger project. Let me instead focus on recent popular film and television engagements with Wagner. First, not only does Birth, Jonathan Glazer, 2004, featuring the wedding march from Lohengrin, analysis with which I began, it also foregrounds a different Wagnerian experience. Shortly after Sean, a 10-year-old boy, comes to Anna's ritzy Manhattan apartment to declare that he is the incarnation of her deceased husband, Anna, played by Nicole Kidman, and her new fiancé, Joseph, go to the symphony. In a bravoure two-minute shot, the camera pushes in on Anna's face as we come to realize that her initial disbelief at the boy's story is rapidly eroding. The music swells, rising to a fevered pitch driven by the violins. The camera studies Anna's face as she reacts to the possibility that the boy really is her dead husband. The fact that this music, the overture from Act One of Die Valkyrie, is Wagnerian raises the question that this scene from birth, operatic in its sensibilities, offers a surprising yet moving 21st century version of the Gesamtkunstwerk theorized some 200 years ago. In perhaps the most intriguing audiovisual use of Wagner to date, Larry David devotes an entire episode of his situation comedy, Curb Your Enthusiasm, first aired in 2000 on HBO in the United States, airing to the present, uh, telling the story of Christmas Day 1870, when Wagner arranged a surprise performance of the Siegfried Idyll for Cosima's birthday. In the, Hollywood, uh, sorry, in the Halloween-themed episode, Trick or Treat, Larry gets into a fight on the street because he is whistling Wagner. An acquaintance of his accuses him of being a, quote, self-hating Jew, to which David responds that he may hate himself, but not because he is Jewish. <laughs> so let me show you this two-minute sequence which begins this episode. No plot uh, dynamics have occurred. They're here to watch the movie premiere of one of their friends uh, in Los Angeles. What is that? I don't know that one. It's Wagner. Really? It's called Siegfried Idol, yeah. and he wrote it as a birthday present for his wife, Cosima. Really? She woke up in the morning, and she heard this beautiful music, and she came out on the landing, and he was conducting this orchestra. And it's so beautiful, so too. romantic. Yeah, listen to this. Are you Jewish? Are you Jewish? 
You want to check my penis? Okay. Huh? Is that what you want? My real question huh? is, yeah, what, what were is you whistling? Yeah, what were you whistling? Hello, Dolly? No, it was Wagner. Oh, was it? Yeah. You, sir, hundred dollars. I want to know what a Jew is whistling Wagner Do you want to know? he was one of the great anti-Semites of the world. You know what you are? What am I? You're a self-loathing Jew. Am I? Oh, yes, well, yes, 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 yes. Jewish. I do hate myself, you, yes. but it has nothing to do with being Jewish, okay? No, it doesn't have anything no, to do doesn't. with being Jewish. Yeah. As millions of Jews right. were taken to the concentration camps okay. with Wagner being played in the background. You know? Yes, Hitler's favorite composer. Really? Yes. You know what? They got a mental asylum a couple of blocks down. No, not down. a mental asylum. I suggest, no, no, no. I suggest you go your heritage? and check yourself Where's in. Where's your Judaism? Okay. Judaism, Judaism, where are you? <laughs> where, where are you, Judaism? Yeah, you have this attitude oh. that you're better. Yeah, they should put I mean, a muzzle on you. You're foaming at the okay, mouth. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Please, yeah. thank you. Yes. Yeah, so, now, this Please. is something you need to think about, all right? Hey. hey, how are you? What's going on? Everything yeah, all right? Uh, no, no, okay? no. Not, but, uh, but I'm looking forward to your movie. I'm so it's going to be you're great. Here. Get a seat. I'm so glad you're yeah. here. Yeah. Is everything all right? You know that guy? It's Walter. Walter? Yeah. He lives right by you. He, he lives by me? He's streets away, your neighborhood. Oh, that's comforting. Really obnoxious. Come on, we should get a seat. Come on. It's a golden rule that every Walter in cinema is a complete asshole. <laughs> Okay, so there's a big digression here. I don't want to run over time, but um, think about what this scene would have looked like if it was filmed like Cannes Theater without penetrating the performance space. You need the over-the-shoulder two shots of um, Cheryl and Larry, and you certainly need the close-up um, of the crazy lunatic. <laughs> well, uh, what Larry David believes is the crazy lunatic, whether that's true or not, we'll talk about. Um, okay, so after several circumlocutions, such as his desire to play golf with his agent instead of spending time with his wife Cheryl on her birthday, David ends the episode on the lawn of this nemesis, awakening the man with a full orchestra blaring Wagner into the Tony neighborhood. Um, I, I've got all these things queued up. If you want to see them later, I'll show you. Uh, in so doing, David is able to use the mechanism of the sitcom to grapple with crucial questions about art. Um, how can it be that the anti-Semitic Wagner made music that radically transformed for the good the entire narrative trajectory of human civilization? Implicitly, David's work raises an equally important question. What does it mean that the epic scope of 19th century tragic opera has been successfully housed in a 23-minute comedy? Now, as recently as 2012, two very different films engage Wagner with varying degrees of intentionality. Last year, Joss Whedon's deconstruction of the teen horror film Cabin in the Woods finds teenagers in rural isolation discovering that they are being used as sacrificial pawns by scientists in order to keep the gods at bay. All hell breaks loose as the scientists lose control over their virginal sacrifice. Monsters escape their cages and the power of scientific culture collapses. Suddenly, the director appears on the screen for the first time in the film. Played by Sigourney Weaver, Ripley from Alien, the film achieves its greatest extrapolation away from the specifics of the slasher film toward the general functioning of narrative. The final girl of Ridley Scott's science fiction masterpiece tells the final girl of Cabin in the Woods to just die already. <laughs> when she refuses, and a monster eats the director instead of the virgin, the gods triumph and return to wreak primitive havoc on industrial modernity. Here, the Cabin in the Woods reaches a Wagnerian level of mythic articulation. The last shot of the film features virginal Dana and the nerd Marty huddling together as the subterranean lab crumbles, and a huge arm of a titan stretches upward to the surface of the earth. The moment beautifully inverts Wagner's romantic celebration of human triumph in Gotterdammerung, wherein the petty bickering of the gods leads to their destruction, and the dawn of man is celebrated with the crumbling of Valhalla. At the end of The Cabin in the Woods, the obverse occurs, as the fall of technocratic man results in the rebirth of the primordial power of nature. The Cabin in the Woods thus beautifully transcends Carol Clover's interest in the cultural specifics of gender and modernity in the horror film, instead pointing towards a mythic understanding of the struggle between civilization and nature, one whose prime intertext is Richard Wagner. Most recently, 
In fact, in a film still playing in current release in movie theaters, Quentin Tarantino's Django Unchained hits the apex of its creativity when the German bounty hunter Schultz, played by Christoph Waltz, learns that the wife of his African-American apprentice Django, Jamie Foxx, is named Brunhilde, played by Kerry Washington. Django asks Schultz to tell him the German legend, since he as a slave has been denied access to such information. In a stunning set piece, Schultz sits before a massive granite rock telling the story of Wotan's punishment of the heroine atop a similar stone and a rescue from confinement within a ring of fire. One imagines that at the time of Schultz's telling of the story, 1858, Richard Wagner across the Atlantic masterminding his operatic retelling of the legend as the ring, having completed portions of Siegfried uh, in 1857. The film's invocation of German culture to tell its story of the American West, relocated to the South, holds interest for at least two reasons. First, the positioning of the slave as a Wagnerian hero links Django Unchained to the deconstructive impulses of Jim Jarmusch's similarly transatlantic Dead Man from 1995. That film also features a European, in this case a Native American expatriate to Great Britain named Nobody, who has to tell the white Easterner, Johnny Depp, that his name, William Blake, references English poetry. Secondly, Django Unchained becomes not so much the Italian spaghetti western that it seems to want to be aesthetically, but a sauerkraut western, a German filmmaking tradition that invokes that country's fascination with the American West. The first thing that the Germans asked me to do when I taught at the Free University in Berlin was to teach about the Western. I hadn't thought about the Western for 25 years. <laughs> the tradition is best exemplified by the most popular works in German publishing history, those of Karl May, whose Vinatou novels also feature a kind-hearted German, Old Shatterhand, in the American West, who's befriended by an Apache chief, Vinatou. These books were adapted into a few dozen German films in the 1960s that formed the base of the so-called sauerkraut western, to which Django Unchained is a sparkling homage. The liberal tradition of Karl May explains a number of improbabilities in Django Unchained. Beyond the unlikelihood of a white man in the Old West befriending an escaped slave, the film positions Schultz increasingly as Tarantino's proxy from present-day America, very similarly to May's alter ego, Old Shatterhand. The German sets the third act of the film in motion as he refuses to shake Calvin Candy's hand, he's the evil slaver, played by Leonardo DiCaprio, after making the deal to buy Brack Brunhilde, instead shooting the plantation owner with a spring-loaded Derringer hidden in his sleeve. This sets off in a bloodbath that results not only in Schultz's untimely death, but the movie horrifyingly jumping the shark. The, the last hour of this movie literally makes no sense. The death of Schultz is the film's biggest mistake as it eliminates both its greatest performance and its most engaging character. For hours after the film was over, I was deeply troubled by my own reaction, wondering if I was merely replicating racism by insisting upon my identification with Schultz. However, the more I tried to work this through, the more I'm forced to argue that the positioning of Schultz as the film's hero and Candy as the film's villain, both of whom die at the second turning point, are the best things the film had going for it. Django Unchained is really, I think, about the unchaining of white guilt for slavery more than it is about the celebration of Django and Brunhilde's reunion. And thus, my somewhat idiotic attempt to intervene theoretically with Alex Ross last night. Django is indeed what Black Wagner looks like in 2013, and we need better methods than archival unearthings to understand such a phenomenon. Like the cabin in the woods, the apocalypse which ends Django Unchained is deliberately played in the key of Wagner. When Django burns Candyland to the ground, what we are witnessing is not so much the destruction of Tara in Gone with the Wind, but Gotterdammerung. In a precise ideological inversion, more historically precise and less mythically abstract than Joss Whedon's, Wagner's installation of the time of man over God is replaced by the imposition of the time of Freeman over Jim Crow. And this is, of course, the film's historiographical crisis. That process has not taken place. <laughs> that the kinds of racism that Django Unchained is about in terms of its setting, it's very similar to the kinds of racism Django Unchained is about in the year 2013. All of which is to say that the stunningly complex 19th century audiovisual oeuvre of Richard Wagner is matched not by the pretentiousness of Cyberberg's epic art cinema, but by the use of Wagner in shards in popular culture.
If you think I'm tilting at windmills, you know, I've been trying to read the Nibelungen lead. <laughs> um, and I have this penguin translation from the 1960s um, by A.T. Hatto. And I just want to read two moments from A.T. Hatto. The first, I'm sure, will annoy you. Um, so modern poets have often returned to the subject, the legend. Prominent among them, Richard Wagner with his gigantic musical drama, Der Ring des Nibelungen, with which, as with Parsifal and Tristan, whatever their merits as modern works of art, he has unfortunately harmed the cause of medieval German poetry by intruding reckless distortions between us and an ancient masterpiece. Um, the theoretical basis of my approach to intertextuality finds that kind of essentialist argument about masterpieces preposterous. <laughs> but this is what got me. Um, so he's going on about the plot. Uh, he thus achieves, that is he, the mysterious author of the Nibelungen Lied, um, thus achieves a work, the finest moments of which would come through even in pidgin English and positively thrive on the prose of Damon Runyon. Indeed, I once read a gripping essay on the plot of the Nibelungen Lied by an undergraduate who knew or pretended to know no better than to treat it as a thriller. It is my proposition that one reason we fail to appreciate the significance of Wagner in contemporary culture is that the Gesamtskunst work is a distinctly modern enterprise, and yet we live in the rubble of postmodernity, invoked not so much as Jamesonian or Leotardian philosophical constructs, but by a description of a culture of shattered texts. Think about this invocation of watching Wagner on YouTube. My students look at everything in shards um, on their iPhones. Um, and this is a description of sociological behavior that we, as people who care about art, need to respond to. My essay has thus attempted to flit about various cinematic invocations of Wag Wagner, not to be coy. Instead, I have attempted to demonstrate that the work of art in the postmodern age of mechanical reproduction lies not in one total system, but in the way individual textual events accumulate into systems uh, unto themselves. And this is my major theoretical intervention. That Wikipedia is a description of a human mode of thought that we live in. OK, for precious few artists, Sophocles, Shakespeare, Melville, their works circulate energy with enough jewels to register on our kinetic map of the culture. Because of his inability, sorry, because of his ability to transform European myths of power and love into exquisitely beautiful and meaningful audiovisual works that continue to resonate into the second decade of the 21st century, Richard Wagner surely belongs in that pantheon, having influenced not just Tolkien and George Lucas, but American generic forms ranging across the animated cartoon, the situation comedy, and the slasher and black exploitation films. The answer to my title's seemingly simple question, what's Wagner doc, indeed strikes at the heart of understanding contemporary American popular culture. If thrillers be that stuff, I count myself proud to be the intellectual descendant of A.T. Haddo's abused undergraduate student. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. Uh, questions? Maybe we'll start with, maybe Jim and Michaela down here. Oh wait, no, he, we have to say something about the brutal censor. I, I wanted to say, uh, wonderful paper. I have to check the emails, but I had no intention of censoring your title, so. I, I, I don't know, I, <laughs> I checked and it seemed like the proposal had that title, but I, it could be wrong. It just was a good rhetorical effect to talk about how beleaguered <laughs> I was. <laughs> We but it was one of these things where the cool title was before the colon. All good things are before the colon, right? <laughs> uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, it calls to mind, uh, well, the public gets it in shards. I mean, and I'm thinking of advertising, television mm -hmm. advertising, is that the, it was a, a, a commercial for Viagra. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that one? Uh, I've seen many commercials for Viagra. Oh, well, <laughs> oh. Okay, well, uh, <laughs> that's another story, but <laughs> um, a couple appears late 
to a Wagnerian sounding opera and you uh -huh. just hear the ending and they, they sit down and then they realize that it is the end, they stand up and applaud. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the references there, the intertextuality with Wagner or, or with what the public conceives of Wagner as being long and, well, uh, enough said. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, there are other cases too, you right. know, in advertising, the Wagnerian singer who demolishes, uh, you know, with this fresh breath or whatever, I don't know. I mean, my, my favorite book in literary studies is Pierre Bayard, How to Read Books, How to Talk About Books You've Never Read. Um, and just think about how most people would not know Wagner in any kind of holistic sense that, that you care about. Um, but like from little snippets of things. Oh, that's Wagner. Um, my students didn't know who Richard Wagner was, but I said, oh, um, what's opera doc? And they're like, oh, that guy, I get it. <laughs> and those are just little sound bites. And, and then this must matter to you all, like it must be the case that those little snippets, Wagner highlights, Wagner in the cinema, those CDs must sell much better than the you know, complete uh, Tannhäuser or something, right? <laughs> I have to ask a little bit about how gesamt is this Kunstwerk really? Um, whether there is some kind of fragmentary character that you think is actually inherent in the original work in terms of the layers of sources. I mean, you quoted the Nibelungen lead, but obviously that it's only one source of many for the ring. Um, and the, the kind of layers of tellings and retellings that you see in almost every single Wagner work, if this, is in so, that if this kind of fragmentary modern culture is actually in some way also an inheritance Wagner, if you say that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the thing that I have with modernist criticism, which sees the kind of reconstruction of the text, say Ulysses and its reconstruction of the Odyssey, as somehow new, cannot possibly account for the way in which Sophocles is reconstructing Greek myth, the way Shakespeare is reconstructing Holinshed, and the way Wagner is reconstructing. Um, so it is absolutely the case um, that a theory of intertextuality and shattering has a long prehistory that we ought to attend to. I was just trying to make a distinction between a kind of particular moment of modernity in the late 19th and the early 20th century and our moment, that I'm not a technological determinist, but the encounter with Wikipedia um, indicates uh, some kind of uh, serious um, cultural shift that, that I think we need to attend to, particularly as people that teach artworks, um, because we tend to want to show them whole films and have them read whole novels. Um, I, Moby Dick is the most important novel to me in the American 19th century. I used to have the students read it, and it destroyed all my classes. And so I just have them read one page, where Ishmael wakes up in bed with Queequeg, and everything I want to say about racism in the 19th century is literally presented on that page. And what Bayard is suggesting is that your students have no more read the totality of Herman Melville's Moby Dick um, if you assign it to them than they have if you just have them read one page. If they've read the one page, um, the philosophical consequence is very similar to if they read the whole thing. They're gonna forget it, and they're gonna be influenced by other things, you're gonna get confused. Is that a movie? Was that in the original Melville? All these kinds of things are crises in how we phenomenologically process things like narrative. Um, Holly, do you want? Uh, Holly? Hi, um, I, I want to follow up on that and just ask, I mean, if everything is shards now, why are you seemingly invested in the concept of the Gesamtkunstwerk and these apparent rewritings of them? I mean, aren't there gestures toward this total work of art in the work of certain film directors? And um, a related question would be, isn't there, so, I mean, despite this shardification you're talking about, isn't there something kind of totalizing in this intertextual um, perspective that you're suggesting in which everything becomes a shard of a, of a totalized shard world? Mm -hmm. And so you're kind of re, um, reimposing totality, um, but in this way that, it, that seems not very self-aware. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there's no question that um, the, the particular uh, kinds of stories that get told, and I would th say something like tracking the ways in which YouTube hits work and whatnot, um, are traces of power dynamics. So I, I think, I, I take your comment um, completely on board. Like, I think that is the case. Um, what I was trying to do, um, 
in, in terms of the first part of your question, uh, is to try to think through the ways, um, sort of right towards the end of the paper, um, in which these kind of few artists seem to resonate across various kinds of historical contexts. Um, so Shakespeare's a good example, right? Like, the ways in which Shakespeare shows up in Asian culture um, indicates that there's something going on in Hamlet um, that if not tending towards cultural universals, at least is able to stretch out very long arms. Um, and I I'm trying to make a middle ground intervention between what I think is a relatively abusive, what we call in uh, film studies, auteurism, right? Like, these great artists make masterpieces. Um, and the kind of abuses of the post-structural tradition, right, like Foucault's author function, like it doesn't matter that Shakespeare was a real guy. There must be some middle ground where we notice that some artworks have long shelf lives because they seem to have a density or complexity that they keep popping up. And I think there's no question um, that Wagner's ring is one of these things. And I think much of the comments that people have made over the last couple of days have given pretty good evidence for this. Um, and I, I would only make that intervention, that one is never on safe ground in the middle because there's always two sides attacking you, but I don't like this kind of thing, Richard Wagner is a genius and we're gonna study his masterpieces, um, but I don't wanna be misconstrued as a post-structuralist that I don't believe in intention and blah, blah, blah. There must be some kind of middle ground that sees artworks as proceeding from acts of consciousness, but then those um, sites of consciousness completely lose control of what's going on. Um, so for example, you know, Freud's reading of Hamlet has nothing to do with Shakespeare's intentions, but it is a desperately important 20th century reading of Hamlet. Um, and just to cycle back to the second part of your question, because I don't want to uh, deny the importance of this, um, that the ideological components of this are important. I think Foucault on heterotopias might be helpful for thinking about this or something. But the place that it came up, I, I tried to put this in and I had no idea how to do it. Um, you know, Alex Ross talked about Birth of a Nation um, last night. Um, in Django Unchained, there's a reconstruction of the right of Valkyries from uh, uh, A Birth of a Nation, but it becomes a comic farce. And so I think this is an example of how this particular thread, like, you know, Tarantino is no big uh, friend of leftist academics or something, and yet despite that, he's produced a solution to what is essentially the crisis of Birth of a Nation, which is it's so damn racist, how can we get beyond the ideological significance to see the aesthetic significance? So by rendering the Birth of a Nation sequence not in a kind of clearly misunderstandable way like in Apocalypse Now, like my students think Apocalypse Now is a rousing war film or something, right? Um, so whatever irony is there is not particularly stable. That's the failure of modernism. Um, that I think what Tarantino is able to do with the right of the Valkyrie scene in his film, they put on bags because they haven't invented the clan helmets yet, and um, they can't see and they fall off the horses. It's just a, a disaster. It really is a punch at this kind of aesthetic and ideological confluence that is the birth of a nation. And I think it's actually one of the most successful moments in the movie. Uh, for a movie that ends with horrifying violence, people were rolling in the aisles at this moment. It's really the biggest laugh moment in that film. We're behind, we're gonna take one more question, Alex. And do you wanna start us up? Uh, yes, well, uh, thank you, first of all, for the little concession uh, based on our exchange uh, last night. It's very kind of you. But um, uh, yeah, I was very happy that he brought up Django and Chain. I was actually hoping that someone would ask me about it uh, last night, the question period. I, I thought of including it in my paper, uh, but uh, it, I was discussing African-American Wagnerism, and, and Quentin Tarantino is, is not, in fact, actually an African-American person, uh, mm -hmm. so he doesn't uh, quite belong in that uh, discussion, and I was focusing on the period. Of, of the late 19th century uh, during the, the high point of international Wagnerism, wondering what uh, was going on with this very little discussed uh, zone of, of, uh, of African Americans engaging with Wagner. But uh, yeah, the, the, the movie is really fascinating. I actually heard about it 
Uh, a year ago, my partner is involved in the film business and has worked with uh, the actress, Kerry Washington, and said to me one day that uh, Kerry was going to be uh, a, a new role in the Tarantino movie as Broomhilda. And I said, <laughs> she's doing what? <laughs> and, and so I've been following this, this project and, and was fascinated to see the movie. Uh, it, it, he doesn't use Wagner and he doesn't mention Wagner, so actually the mass audience could sit through this entire experience and, and have absolutely no conception that, that uh, Wagner is involved, uh, which uh, uh, sort of puts it in, in a somewhat different category from all the movies and TV shows and so on that explicitly make reference uh, to Wagner. But uh, he, he does sort of use this, this Wagnerian material, I think, in, in a really smart and, and striking way uh, that, that shows uh, some, some pretty deep historical awareness of of Germans in, in America in the 19th mm -hmm. century as well, because I very briefly mentioned in my talk last night Karl Schurz, uh, and there were a number of other uh, uh, liberals, uh, sort of uh, 1848 uh, revolutionaries who fled and came to America, uh, many German soldiers who fought uh, in uh, the Union Army, mm -hmm. uh, who were uh, involved in uh, the abolition movement. Um, there was uh, Otto Wesendonck's brother, uh, Hugo uh, Wesendonck, uh, who was uh, an 1848 liberal who came over, who um, uh, ended up being tremendously uh, successful in the life insurance uh, business. Uh, if you go to Union Square in New York, uh, on the north side of Union Square, uh, what is now the W Hotel, uh, was built as the uh, the headquarters of uh, uh, Wesendonck's insurance company, uh, the Guardian Life Insurance Company, uh, after his death. Uh, that's sort of beside the point. Uh, but uh, so yeah, so so there's this you know modern audiences would would look at this and and find it well. What could be more absurd than a black guy and and a German guy hanging out? Uh, but there there is a kind of uh, historical truth uh, to that uh, connection uh, and. And then, yes, this this uh, this amazing uh, narrative uh, that sh that Schultz gives uh, based on the um, the story of uh, Brunhilde on the rock. And what I read in in the in the media was that um, uh, Christoph Waltz, the 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 actor, took uh, Tarantino to see Die Valkyrie in Los Angeles, the <laughs> Akim Fryer production. Huh. And uh, I guess the story of Django and Chain was already brewing uh, in Tarantino's mind, and, and he was very struck by the similarities and ended up inserting this, this dialogue in, into, the, into the film. So no, I think you, you bring up some really interesting larger questions about uh, this, these contemporary sort of illusory or fragmentary appearances of, of Wagner detached uh, somewhat from the subject. But the final point I make is, of course, Wagner's, the, the loss of control that you talk about, that's very important, uh, Wagner becoming detached from, from, from the intentionality, from, from the consciousness uh, of the creator, happened very early. <laughs> it happened in 1861 <laughs> with the publication of Baudelaire's essay on Tannhäuser, uh, a, a brilliant engagement uh, with, the, uh, with the work that is uh, really drifting uh, somewhat far away. Uh, from from what Wagner seems to have been you know concerned with, uh, and the correspondence between them is is uh, fascinating because I think Wagner didn't quite know what to make <laughs> of what uh, where Baudelaire was going uh, with this analysis uh, of the opera, and I think this is something that Wagner scholars have been engaging with for a long time. What is this quote unquote Wagner that uh, the, who who multiplies and goes in every direction uh, from from the original creator? Yeah. Well, thank you. I'm so glad you came. I, uh, you know, I thought about last night, um, maybe the dire was the wrong way to go. Maybe Gilroy, you know, Paul Gilroy's Black Atlantic is a theoretical formulation. And I think your project about um, the African-American singer and my thing about Django um, share that kind of interest in what Gilroy conceptualizes as a Black Atlantic. Um, I just went for Dyer because he's do so much with Paul Robeson and the meaning of race and music. But yeah, thank you for the comment.